Hello, welcome to Holistically Speaking. I'm your host, Morala DeVoe. Our mission with Holistically Speaking is to be the avenue through which the voices of holistic health reach you at the time you need it most. Lately, I've been doing a few shows on my own. You may or may not be aware that I'm a holistic health counselor. I work with nutrition and hypnosis to help my clients be healthier and happier. And today I wanted to share with you a topic that's really near and dear to my heart. I want to share with you some different perspectives on cholesterol and helping people, uh, how I help people manage their cholesterol. The reason why I say this is near and dear to my heart, it's because uh, both my parents had high cholesterol and they were both taking medication for it and actually having some side effects from the medications they were taking. And so I, I started to feel really compelled to learn more about it and, and help them in any way that I could and find ways in which you can help your body um, manage cholesterol effectively and hopefully not need medication. So that's some of the things that I'm going to share with you today have to do with uh, the work that I've been doing with my clients for the past few years, starting with my parents. Um, and it's all based, I didn't come up with any of this on my own, um, it's all based on the work of um, you know, trailblazing cardiologists. I think of them as my heroes. Uh, one of my, my favorite cardiologists to follow is Ron Rosedale. And he has a wonderful website that I really suggest you uh, check out. Um, it's drrosedale.com, and I'll have that website for you at the end of the show. Um, so Dr. Rosedale has done an incredible job of helping to shed light on what really is cholesterol, what's happening in your circulatory system when you have high cholesterol, what's the purpose for cholesterol, and really how do you manage it effectively? And it's not about cutting back on the fat. A lot of what we hear in kind of mainstream media and the commonly shared belief is that if you have high cholesterol, what you need to do is cut back on the fat. And that doesn't necessarily work for everybody. So I want to share with you today some, um, some different uh, tools and different ideas on how you can make some slight changes into your diet, maybe take some supplements that, that can support you in that. And I also have another doctor that I, I follow, and he does an incredible job of reading all of the latest research and sharing what he's finding from the research. His name is Dr. Joseph Mercola, and he has a very uh, popular newsletter that he issues almost on a daily basis, and that his website is mercola.com. I'll also have that for you at the end of the show. So I'll also share with you some of his recommendations for cholesterol. But the, the, the basic thing, and this I learned from Dr. Rosedale, is what is cholesterol and what does it really mean? Um, if we can show that first slide on, on cholesterol, if we can show our viewers, there we go. So Dr. Rosedale helps to shed light that high cholesterol is a sign of high inflammation in your circulatory system. Cholesterol is used for many other bodily functions like producing vitamin D and even steroid hormones, but oftentimes when cholesterol rises, it's uh, really a sign of inflammation. And this little illustration that I wanted to show you is that the majority of the cholesterol in your body is produced in your liver. So that yellow arrow at the top is essentially to show that the majority of the cholesterol flowing out of your liver and into uh, your uh, arteries is, um, or let me take a back pedal a little bit, uh, all of the cholesterol uh, in your arteries is um, coming from your liver. And so when it leaves your liver, it leaves in these really small particles called the, what we call LDL particles. It's the low density lipoprotein cholesterol. And so that's the cholesterol that's leaving your liver to go into your, and it goes into your circulatory system. And then the bottom part of this screen, what it's showing is that uh, after the cholesterol is doing its job in your circulatory system, it goes through a process that's called esterification, where it turns into these high-density lipoprotein particles that are kind of, we can think of them as larger particles, and they return to your liver and get absorbed back. So um, 
the cholesterol that's leaving your liver is the LDL cholesterol and the cholesterol that's leaving your circulatory system to return to your liver is the HDL cholesterol. And then any excess cholesterol gets excreted with bile uh, salts and you know, bile into your, it gets excreted into your colon to eliminate it. And, and that's the green arrow to the bottom right. So one of the things to notice is the LDL particle is what is they call the bad cholesterol. You can think of L as lousy for bad. So the, what they call bad cholesterol is that LDL particles. And what they call good cholesterol is the HDL particles, the happy cholesterol. Now really, it's all cholesterol. It's neither good nor bad. It's all serving a purpose. And if you see there, the LDL particle is part of a pro-inflammatory response. There's some cell repair that's needed somewhere in your body. And oftentimes, there are like little scratches and tears inside your arteries. So the cholesterol is leaving your liver because there's a purpose for it. So it's helping to almost create a Band-Aid inside your artery walls. And it's a very healthy pro-inflammatory response. Inflammation is the healing response in your body. And once that healing takes place, the inflammation should go down. So that cholesterol becomes esterified, and so the HDL particle, it becomes an HDL particle, which is the anti-inflammatory response, meaning the cell repair is done, the healing has taken place, no longer, there's no need for, for this um, cholesterol anymore, and it goes back into your liver. So it's really neither good nor bad, it's just serving a purpose. And the issue is when, uh, LDL cholesterol or that lousy cholesterol of the top, if your liver is producing a lot of it and the healing isn't happening, then it's not becoming HDL uh, cholesterol. It's not returning back to your liver. And so, you know, you can think of a traffic jam in your ar uh, arteries where the LDL is building up and it's starting to create an issue. But if they're both in balance, if you're sending out as much cholesterol as you're gathering back in, then you know you have nicely open flowing arteries and everything's good. So the reason why I'm sharing with you this graphic is to demystify a little bit the the notion that uh, cholesterol is bad, that uh, all high cholesterol is an issue. Really, the issue is if that bad cholesterol and the good cholesterol are out of balance. If they're in balance, it really uh, doesn't, shouldn't present um, a significant issue. And so one of the first things that you're going to want to look at when you, are, you get your cholesterol levels is you want to look at your ratios. And what's great is that now your blood work usually is coming already. It already uh, shows you that uh, HDL to total uh, cholesterol ratio. So that middle table that you see there on the screen, the HDL to total cholesterol, this is typically the ratio that uh, you're seeing in your blood work. What essentially this means is it looks at what proportion of your total cholesterol is that HDL or happy cholesterol, that one that's returning to your liver, just to make sure that it's high enough. So you might have high total cholesterol, but you might, if you have high good cholesterol, the HDL, then it really isn't that much of an issue. The other ratio that you can look at is the one to the left, is looking at uh, the ratio of LDL cholesterol to HDL cholesterol. And so what you want to be sure is that they're both, um, they're either both, uh, th that they're both in balance. You don't want to have too high LDL and low HDL. That's when you start to create that traffic jam and accumulation of cholesterol inside your artery walls. And then the other ratio that's important to look at is your triglycerides to HDL ratio. Um, and so triglycerides are actually a measurement of fat in your blood, but it's the fat that has been converted uh, from sugar. So excess sugar gets converted in your liver into triglycerides for storage. And so looking at this ratio is also a good idea because if your triglycerides are too high, it can promote um, the, it can promote some issues with inflammation. So I think uh, what I suggest is for you to look up these ratios. Mercola.com has them so you can do the math and see where you fall in these tables. So coming back to the um, the question, so what is making your liver produce this excess cholesterol? 
And what Dr. Rosedale does a great job of uh, illuminating us of is that it isn't about eating uh, high cholesterol foods or necessarily eating too much fat. What's happening is we're having an ex excessive inflammatory response in our, in our circulatory system. There might be little scratches and tears inside the circulatory system and therefore your liver is responding by creating a lot of this cholesterol to help coat those artery walls. It's almost like the scab that would form on your skin if you cut yourself uh, and your, bl your blood starts to coagulate to form that scab to produce healing, that's a little bit of the same type of thing that's happening inside your artery walls when cholesterol starts to layer itself on your artery walls. There's a little bit of healing that's needing to take place. The issue is, much like a scab, if the healing doesn't happen, then you, start, you have that scab on there forever. And then it starts to build up and, and it presents an issue. But the real issue is what's causing those little scabs, the, the, those little tears, and that is essentially a diet that's high in inflammation, a stressful life, lack of physical activity, and so he, he really helps us start to look at, well, what's the diet that promotes high inflammation? And so I want to show you a slide of our standard American diet. So if you look to the far left, we have the standard breakfast foods, eggs and bacon and toast. We've got muffins, even these really beautiful brand muffins and cereal, maybe it's bagels or donut. So for the most part, you see that breakfast foods are mostly carbohydrates, starches, and animal protein. Then, you know, lunches might be a peanut butter and jelly sandwich or bologna sandwich, a slice of pizza, burger and french fries. You know, we, we eat pretty convenient, quick lunches. A lot of people eat their sandwiches. So what do we have again? More car carbohydrates, starches, cheese, animal foods, not a whole lot of vegetables. Some people, you know, do really great and have salads, but for the most part, there's a lot of starch and a lot of uh, animal protein. Then a mid-afternoon snack, it might be some pretzels, some chips, maybe there's a little candy, a cookie here or there. And then for dinner, we have again our uh, balanced meal. The way we think of balanced meal is the protein, the starch, and a vegetable. So we've got maybe chicken, meatloaf, a piece of steak, maybe it's some pasta, um, mashed potatoes, and then the classic vegetables, peas, carrots, corn, which are, tend to be you know, the sweeter uh, starchier vegetables. And then maybe for dessert you have a piece of cake or maybe at night before you go to bed you have a bowl of ice cream. So what we have here is a lot of starches and a lot of animal foods and not so many vegetables. What we are also missing here if you notice is not a whole lot of fish. A lot of people are not regular fish eaters. So we're missing fish, we're missing colorful vegetables, you know, a side salad here or there isn't really a staple food. So what's going on here is the majority of these foods tend to be pro-inflammatory. So excess fats, excess uh, fried oils, and excess saturated fats will present an issue if you're, they're not balanced with the omega-3s. Um, and excess starches and excess sugars are also going to be pro-inflammatory. So the issue is not really an issue of fats, it's an issue of inflammation we're eating way too many inflammatory foods and this is what's really the engine behind high cholesterol. So the answer then isn't necessarily to just cut back on the fats because a lot of people will cut back on the fats and then that leads them to eat you know, more of the uh, refined grains, crackers, low, low fat foods, low fat dressing that then has more sugar. So it's still a pro-inflammatory food. So the real answer is adding more of the anti-inflammatory foods. And what are the anti-inflammatory foods? The fish that I mentioned, omega-3 fats, is one of the essential nutrients that we're highly missing in the standard American diet. So, and the other issue too is that because we've contaminated our waters, I think we're gonna come back to that, late, that this slide a little later, so we're not gonna look at these just yet. So, um, the issue is we need to eat more fish, but now we know you can't eat tuna every day because tuna now has mercury and heavy metals, um, PCBs, et cetera. So we need to get clean 
fish on a regular basis. And ideally, this would be sardines, anchovies, mackerel, um, or taking an omega-3 supplement. So omega-3s are the very first element of an anti-inflammatory diet that you need to be increasing in order to manage your cholesterol effectively and naturally. The second piece is fiber. The fiber in the green vegetables that we're missing, you know, oftentimes you think of oatmeal and fiber foods, people think of whole grain bread or the oatmeal I mentioned or brown rice, and these are great fiber foods, but even better fiber foods are spinach and celery and chard, kale, all of these non-starchy vegetables that we're most missing. And the other thing with these foods is the deep, deep pigments in the dark leafy greens that are highly anti-inflammatory. They give your body incredible resources to heal. The chlorophyll helps your liver um, clean out your blood. So the deep leafy greens are one of the cornerstones of an anti-inflammatory diet that will help you manage your cholesterol effectively. So, so far we're adding more fats in the form of omega-3s and we're adding more leafy greens. The other thing that we're missing in that bread and meat diet is all of the color in nature, just like the leafy greens, the purples and reds and oranges and yellows. Those are the pigments in nature that help your body heal. And they have nothing to do with calories or vitamins or minerals. It's these magical pigments that we almost don't understand how they work. It's the reason why you hear that our glass of red wine has hard protective qualities. One of the reasons that red pigment in the skin of the red grapes is called resveratrol. And resveratrol is a powerful antioxidant that's help, it's going to help you keep that inflammation in your artery walls down, help your circulatory system heal, help everything heal, and keep uh, free radicals under, under check. So we've got omega-3 fats, we've got the fiber from dark leafy greens, we've got the color from colorful foods, berries and cherries and all about that. And it's not so much about obsessing about the low fat. Of course, you don't want to be eating things you know, that are fried. The fried, heated vegetable oils are one of the worst um, fats that we could be eating. Whereas saturated fats like coconut oil and butter um, can actually be better for cooking because they're more stable. So you eat them in moderation. You saute your vegetables in some coconut oil which by the way has, is showing to be wonderful for managing inflammation as well. So you can look that up on the internet as well. So you can use some saturated fats to saute your vegetables and balance it with the uh, fish oil. And as long as those are in balance, you're gonna be doing a, a much better job of helping to keep that cholesterol in balance. If you remember that graphic, that slide I showed you, the cholesterol that's leaving your liver is a pro-inflammatory response, thank you. So that cholesterol that's leaving your liver is that pro-inflammatory response for healing. You know, the pro-inflammatory foods will promote that, but then the anti-inflammatory foods will help to gather it back up and boost those um, HDL particles. Um, so it'll help you increase your HDL. Thank you for, for showing that slide. So there, are, I was talking about omega-3 supplements. Um, Flaxseed oil or fish and krill oil can, can be helpful. Um, the other supplements that are also known to help with high cholesterol are, for example, astaxanthin. Um, it's the deep pigment that gives shrimp their color. It's a pigment that comes from algae. And so the shrimp and krill eat the algae and they turn pink. And then the salmon comes along and eats the shrimp or the krill and it turns pink and that deep pigment is a powerful pow powerful antioxidant and it's showing to have heart protective qualities. I also mentioned resveratrol. Um, you, you can get resveratrol in uh, red grapes and cherries and, and blueberries but you can also get a, a resveratrol supplement. Then turmeric is a yellow bright, bright yellow herb that looks like ginger, and it's the herb that gives curry its color. It's that powerful, powerful orange uh, spice that gives curry its color, and it's 
a powerful anti-inflammatory food. In fact, I once had a client who had a ganglion cyst on her ankle and she was doing a, a cleansing program with me and I suggested that she take turmeric for the inflammation that was promoting that ganglion cyst and she, was, she had scheduled surgery to have it removed and for four weeks she was doing this detox program prior to her surgery and taking the turmeric and within four weeks the ganglion cyst completely disappeared and she canceled her surgery. That's how powerful uh, a, an anti-inflammatory food can be in helping your body heal. So turmeric is well known to be uh, an anti-inflammatory agent. Coenzyme Q10 is absolutely essential for anybody who has uh, high cholesterol, especially if you're taking a, a statin um, to control your cholesterol. The statin drugs interfere with the liver function that produces coenzyme Q10, so you need to take a coenzyme Q10 supplement or a ubiquinol. It's a precursor of coenzyme Q10. And so CoQ10 uh, is like, a I call it like a little key that turns the engines in every single cell in your body. And so um, the lack of this nutrient will affect things like energy, uh, you might feel like your muscles feel heavy, like you can't move them. So it's essential to take a coenzyme Q10 supplement if you're taking a statin drug, especially. And in general, it's a, our, we lose the, the ability to pro produce enough coenzyme Q10 in our liver as we age. So in general, the majority of us in our adult age do benefit from taking a coenzyme Q10 supplement. Um, so I suggest you look that up. Uh, Mercola has some great inf information on coenzyme Q10. Um, and then a fiber supplement is another thing that I often recommend that people take. Um, some of my favorites are psyllium husks, um, rolled oats also works well, or flaxseed, ground flaxseed. I really like psyllium because it absorbs a lot of water and it, it acts like a mop. Uh, sweeping your colon, so it helps also to keep your, your colon nice and, and healthy. Um, so I really like psyllium. And what you would do is take a tablespoon first thing in the morning with some water and you drink that rather quickly uh, because it absorbs the water pretty quickly. The other one is oatmeal. Uh, taking a tablespoon of rolled oats, soaking it overnight, and then drinking that in the morning. Um, one of the beauties of the oats in addition to the fiber, obviously, is the fact that they have a nutrient called the beta-glucan, and that has been studied and documented to help with cholesterol as well. So you get a double benefit there, if you will. So taking a, a fiber supplement is also something that you might want to do if you want to get really dil diligent with managing your, your cholesterol. So Dr. Mercola also has some suggestions and I wanted to share those with you. Uh, you can find this on his website, but the first thing that he says, he doesn't even start talking about fats. He says what we really need to look at is reducing our grains and eliminating sugar. Ref refined sugar should really be eliminated, sodas, candies, pastries, dessert, etc. And really looking at how much grain you're eating, the breads, the pastas, crackers, cookies, cereals, all of those, can tend to have a, a pro-inflammatory response for the majority of people. Number two is eating as much of your food raw as possible. This is a little harder in the winter, but one of the things that you get from raw food is that it's very high in enzymes, and enzymes are potent for managing inflammation. So eating food raw is critical. Um, eating plenty of omega-3 fats from fish and nuts like walnuts or getting an omega-3 supplement, eliminating vegetable oils like corn, canola, soy, and safflower. These are very high in omega-6, and omega-6 is the opposite of omega-3. Omega-6 has a pro-inflammatory response. So you want to minimize those, and Mercola says actually flat out eliminate the corn, canola, and soy, and safflower oil. Adding fermented foods to your diet Fermented foods are things like raw sauerkraut or kimchi or um, yogurt and kefir. The fermented foods are alive with enzymes and healthy bacteria that help to boost your intestinal health. Um, 
Number six is optimizing your vitamin D levels through healthy sun exposure or through a, vit a vitamin D supplement. And we've talked about this in previous shows. Uh, some of our health experts who've joined us have uh, shared that they believe everybody in Vermont needs a vitamin D supplement because we don't get enough sun exposure. Number seven is exercising daily. The physical activity is well known, as you've heard this a million times, well known to help with overall health, moods, but it also boosts the anti-inflammatory response. Obviously, limiting your consumption of alcohol is essential. Uh, alcohol will also tend to promote inflammation. And finally, getting good quality sleep. If you're not sleeping well at night, if you're not getting a restful sleep, your body simply doesn't have a chance to uh, repair, regenerate, bring that inflammation down. And chronic stress is also going to promote inflammation. So those are Mercola's basic recommendations. I want to share with you some resources before we run out of time. Um, the last couple of slides or screens. This is Dr. Ron Rosedale's website. He's a cardiologist at drrosedale.com. And I suggest you look up his article uh, on his website that he writes, uh, cholesterol is not the cause of heart disease, which is a fascinating kind of technical article, but really great to help you educate yourself. And Dr. Mercola's website is mercola.com. He's the one who's constantly sharing all kinds of research, has lots of nutritional recommendations on his site. And then finally, the Weston Price Foundation. It's westonaprice.org. Um, they also have a, a, some wonderful articles on uh, saturated fats. And this one in particular, under cardiovascular disease, the benefits of high cholesterol, uh, those, th it'll be a really kind of eye-opening uh, read for you. I highly recommend you check that out. So just to recap, it's not just about saturated fat. Uh, don't make it about saturated fat or high cholesterol. Foods like bacon or eggs, eat more fiber, eat more omega-3 oils, fish oil, flaxseed oil, walnuts, um, or clean fish like sardines. Uh, add more fiber to your diet like kale, collards, chard, berries in all of the colorful, beautiful foods. Uh, raspberries and tomatoes and peppers um, and you'll be headed probably in a better direction than if you were just to cut back on the fats. So I hope this has been helpful, maybe uh, illuminating, and I highly recommend that you check out those websites so you can find more. Thank you for joining me today and I will see you next time. Take care.